Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 629, that's 629 of the Agostino Zynga show, I hope you're doing well wherever this bluey, blimey podcast may find you, I hope you are doing splendid, how am I, all things considered, not too bad. The last couple of days or the last week or so, I've been, well no, let's say last couple of days actually. I've been smashing through the Scissor album and I've also been listening to the Metro Boomin album from front to back. Metro Boomin, just to kind of give an overview, I'm not going to do a full in-depth review, I'll probably do that in the next pod when I really dissect and meditate on my views and my kind of feelings towards both albums because I think they were very well done. But for the Metro specifically, I think that is probably the best representation we have ever gotten so far in the modern era of a producer compilation type tape in the same way that DJ Khaled does his type of tape. Because I feel like, you know, DJ Drama feels like more of a collaborative project. He made, I feel like more he's a executive producer as opposed to like a beat maker or a producer who's putting together the beats and the songs for it. He maybe arranges certain things, gets certain people on certain tracks and whatever, maybe put certain writers in a room. But in terms of the quintessential producer compilation, I think what Metro Boomin has done has been nothing short of amazing. Especially when you consider, you know, his own personal circumstances and the tragic way he lost his mother this year, RIP, and everything else connected to it. I just feel like that aside, if you do want to just get, you know, if you do want to cut any sentiment, any empathy away from it, just look at it as from the artistic point of view. You look at the rollout, you look at all the creative work that spawned from it, all the, all the, all the amazing comic book type illustrations. You look at just how the songs are arranged, the features on there. Um, what meant to be an interlude turns out to be one of the best tunes on there. The ability to present Travis Scott in a in a somewhat favorable light because I feel like post you know Astro World tragedy, his flipping music hasn't really been hitting the same. I'm not sure it's because I've still got that lingering thought in my mind that you know ten kids died at his concert, or it's the fact that maybe his music has hit a bit of a ceiling. But still, Metro Boom was able to extract the best out of him. Also, this overuse or this constant use, or why I feel like it's a new gen of love for. Don Tolliver has been a bit weird to witness from the far. It feels like he's essentially taken over from Jeremiah's spot. He's kind of like the go-to, you know, R&B crooner to get on a tune. And because he's got a particular tonality in his voice and warmness and softness, he immediately adds a level of panache and a level of finish that you would expect from if you were to get a feature from like a Bruno Mars. You get a Bruno Mars feature and then all of a sudden your tune goes from sounding like something that should be on SoundCloud to something that should be played in the background as you're shopping in H&M or something. It kind of just adds a little bit sprinkling of it on top. But the Don Tolliver thing is funny too because if I'm not mistaken, wasn't he accused of or found guilty? I'm not quite sure which one it was. I want to say allegedly because I'm not too sure. But he was involved in some madness with some girl recently and i remember court documents coming out i saw a clip of someone talking about it where essentially his girlfriend who's a very famous singer at the moment too name escapes me had to basically testify in court that he's a good guy now that you know he did the bad thing before but now he's reformed which again adds to another catalog of instances that really do confuse me and um you know it's kind of it's going to be a perennial question for me that i'm probably never going to get the answers to as to why girls are so quick to forgive dudes who do things you know to women like you don't really see many single um essays right you don't really see many single r words for the most part they always find a way to find another partner even if some of them tell lies i'm pretty sure they do they probably embellish or leave out chunks of their story maybe the lady that they're with now has no idea of the devious and horrific and cruel things that her husband or partner did prior to hooking up cool but i do think a lot of them probably do tell and own up to the things they've done in their past and for some reason for some women out there it doesn't affect the way that they look at them they're like yeah cool i trust you i'm gonna relationship with you i'll marry you i have your kids it's kind of interesting to me but anyway don't tell on there he's he absolutely smashes it as well but yeah compilation wise that's amazing and of course switching over to scissor what a superb album especially considering the weight especially considering how well received control was especially when you consider how annoying she is as an artist on social right she kind of drives people up the wall a little bit her personality and i don't know for some reasons i feel as if people when they have that kind of when they have that sort of personality where they kind of um, caught attention then get annoyed and attentions at them and then enjoy all the back and forths around it 
all that time is basically spent not doing the art because it's one thing if you're doing the art and you're also doing a bit of shit posting to you know drive some traffic your way all well and good uh, when it comes to social media but i feel like a majority of those people enjoy the sport of shit posting more than they do actually doing the thing that they meant to be doing to get paid you know what i mean it's a weird way even though you could say shit posting can help you get paid in the long run because all oh, eyes are on you uh, it's nice to see a scissor is one of those people it's nice to see that maybe when she's on the toilet having a shit or something she just spurts out a couple of crazy hot takes or whatever it may be closes the comments and then just watches the fire burn <laughs> yeah you know i mean but the album was absolutely smashing i love the meme going out at the moment that people are saying that it's the female version of future tendrix that came out what 2017 or something i think that's the one that's got the track where um, he's like saying you know he's got all these girls like if he's fucking wild and stuff, like it doesn't matter if it's just once you're in his collection that sort of thing i think that was the album that he did as a retort to ciara and all the things that are being painted about him in the media that he was a bad guy and that she got you know she basically got the good end of the deal because she's free of him he's like it doesn't matter that i still hit <laughs> which is absolutely incredible one of my favorite albums so it's pure levels of mass you know misogynism and flipping toxicity levels i flipping love it and people are saying that this is the album is the same i guess the only thing you could say is that maybe criticism of the scissor album is that she's getting a little bit old right i wouldn't say old she's not exactly a gen z i don't think so let me just double check and see how old she is i've never actually checked let me see if my phone my computer crash if i started doing it scissor age let's see how old she is oh shit she's 33 yeah see i knew she wasn't like 26 or something so she's a lot older than she appears or that she comes across on social media and I guess when you start talking about what she's talking about on that album, it can come across a little bit cringe. I can understand that if you're a grown up and you're like, you know what? I'm not really understanding why this lady is speaking like she's some Gen Z kid, um, you know, using what's those terms that kids say nowadays, um, era and all that sort of stuff, right? This is my single era. This is my this era. It's not really an era for her. She's a grown up and probably should be um singing about more substantial things than what's one of the tracks called let me see it quickly because i thought the the track listing was amazing the track names um and also the bars in it they're all worthy of captions sos you got kill bill seek and destroy you got low love language blind used snooze notice me smoking on my x pack which is an amazing um track for an uh, uh, amazing song title for for her to use ghost in ghost in the machine you got f2f from nobody gets me um, conceited special too late far sure open arms hate you good days and forgiveness but you forget also man the amount of bangers on this album is crazy i think i saw something along the lines of um i think maybe academics maybe tweeted it that the album's already looking to sell already three hundred thousand copies which makes sense because there's a lot of flipping smashes on here right like good days being a clever and obvious example but still this lady knows how to put hits together the tracks and the lyrics may be a bit corny and a bit cheesy, but they resonate with a large, large swath of the female audience out there, which is absolutely amazing to see. And in general, you know, I just love it, man. It's a good vibe and I love the cover also. Everything about it is absolutely incredible. So hopefully we have got to break it down a little bit more in the next pod and give you a play by play as to what tracks I love the best and feature some of the more poignant ones, especially the tracks and whatnot. We can go from there. But before we do all that, before we do all that, we obviously, 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 obviously have to talk about the new lineup just announced regarding Bergheim in general. You know the deal. You know I'm the kind of unofficial, official, unofficial, official spokesperson for that flipping Berlin establishment. And they have produced and published the January 2023 lineup. And let's say it's one for the books. There's this common um, thinking in a little scene of people that love to go to Bergheim like I do that usually the best nights are usually the ones after the big event so it's after new year's eve that's after i think may day and then there's another one i think i forgot what the big one is but there's a few dates in the year where those are the kind of the big ones right where everyone i think the other ones i think of maybe gay pride or something what are the other but there's a common thinking around people that go there a lot is that actually you should suck off going to the big events because they're usually going to be rammed they're usually going to be crazy queues um you might be have to pay you might have to pay a little bit extra than you would do on just a regular weeknight and then also um it's going to be full of tourists that's usually the thing that people always say so always try and go the week or a couple of weeks after the big event because usually those are the times when it's basically quote unquote full of regulars or locals and you can legitimately get a better feeling or a better idea whether or not you like the club or not because that's how it should be presented like in that kind of you know um non-tainted form and i would tend to agree because for the most part when i was working in retail and i didn't really earn that much money i used to always go around january to 
let's say april maybe not april i don't know actually yeah january to april maybe start of april or the end of march were the dates i usually went and not because i was smart or because i knew what the dates to go outside of the flipping hot dates no i only did it because it was a time that i could afford to go especially on a retail salary where you're making like you know maybe you're making close to a thousand pounds a month sometimes it's less it's 900 minus your rent and all your living costs you're not really left with much so you have to make your money stretch as far as possible and the way i could do it was obviously to you know not go out the entire month before that and then just spur you know blow my whole load on that one trip but what you did get was the advantage of going and the trip prices the ticket for always so cheap like i think i just checked recently i'm not gonna check too much because i've got this weird um feeling that every time you check flights on Ryanair beforehand and you do too many inputs it notices it and then jacks the price up so you then you can you know jump on and book it not sure if that's true or not but it's a little feeling that i have but when i checked last time for flights i saw flights in january that were especially now it's not even a month you know it's not even a it's probably over a month now until the dates that i'm kind of thinking of going so it's probably under a month time in, in advance and still i could find flights for like 40 pounds or something which is crazy because nowadays it feels like those 40 30 20 pounds right in there kind of you know european flights are long gone those days are gone you have to especially if you're going to go on the dates that everyone else goes you probably have to pay two for now to go so the fact that that's available is absolutely incredible regardless um but the lineup is absolutely crazy and definitely with those flights and you know with how affordable it is considering the cost of living nowadays this might be an absolute great time to go and to you know have a little bit of fun have a bit of boogie and come back feeling nice and bloody strong but from what you can see so far look here i've been just looking at it now there's an even ones for the six that are on 21 quid which is absolutely crazy but from looking at this now january 2023 um you've got all the lineups are already released down there and then the ones i picked out the ones i'm kind of interested in trying to check it out are probably this weekend which is the what does it say here it's the 13th actually the 13th weekend which is atello bar so atello rama bar and bordello a parigi as you can tell it's mostly an italian you know i tell a disco type theme that which i'm all for because i absolutely love that type of music in general especially considering that i used to absolutely demolish and smash disco back in the day when i was playing that quite regularly so you know a common thing that you would always kind of jump to would be disco to kind of get the crowd rocking especially if you're playing in a random bar or like old synth pop or like itello disco there's always great ways to kind of get your regular schmegular person to kind of get involved and want to dance at an electronic party without feeling like you know you're basically smacking them over the head by playing some blow on that flipping 7 p.m not a good idea but regardless the flipping panorama bar um, line up here at Telerama Bar with Bordello at Par Parigi, how you pronounce that. It's got Anomonix playing live, I'm not too familiar with. You've got Juliella Goodner, who, no, Julie, Julia, Julia Gutierrez, is that how you pronounce the name? Gutierrez. Um, you've got Lau, who I know. You've got Richelli Sogini, who I don't know. The Hack, obviously, that I know. And Vazenti and Saka, who I know. So that should be a good one just to check out of the night because I haven't been to a specific night where they only had Panorama Bar open in a long time. Um, usually, when I go, I'm always going on a Saturday when both rooms are open, but it's quite nice to go on that one night where only Panorama Bar is open and see what the vibe is saying that way. So that would be pretty nice. And obviously, fashion wise as well, it's so a time to maybe put on some bright colors and not be wearing all black all the time so that'd be a nice gentle surprise then the following night in the main Berghain, you've got a pretty pretty sick lineup you've got cecilia tosh playing you've got fr jpla you've got jacko jacko you've got justin perry you've got Cosella, you've got my guy Rene wise playing so that should be awesome to go see him playing Berghain because i think i think he played there a couple of times prior once that i was able to see this small bit of and the other few times no the other set the other time maybe it was free time i'm not too sure but i remember one time people saying rave reviews around it and the other time i went i was a bit off my head so i you remember bits of it but this time it's going to be absolutely lodged in the front of my flipping cranium because i'm going to go in there stone cold sober listen to the set absolutely go crazy and then get on it like an absolute sonic the hedgehog panorama bar is going to have a, a, a linka who i'm a big fan of god jensen obviously who i love and see play many 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 times here jennifer cardini who i'm a big fan of also even though i feel like sometimes she kind of cats god jensen a little bit she's a little bit you know too similar in terms of style i'm pretty sure they're both I'm pretty sure she's also signed to running back, if I'm not mistaken. Am I mistaken? Of that, let me quickly click here. 
yeah she is oh no she's not my bad she's on um correspondent but regardless um <laughs> i do feel like she's got loads of similarities in style between them two um but obviously i'm not I'm mad at that masiana pagagaro of course i'm on i'm eager to see him play again Oxon, I don't really know too well. Richie, I don't know. And Sedef Asi, I know because she's a resident. And then the rest of the nights are also really good. This one with, with DJ Spitz going to be quite nice. I've no, not heard of any of these people. All C, CC, Coco, Cobra, and Crypto Fauna. And DJ Spit playing DJ Spit, I'm a big fan of. This Saturday, the 21st, is really popular too. A lot of people are really excited to see Talisman play. Um, I'd be more you know, interested to see Mary. Mary Yosef Go Yosef Koz Kozkaya. Jesus Christ these names. Because obviously she's more minimal and obviously with that kind of resurgence coming up, that'd be pretty cool to see her play. Chris Cruz playing in Pano Barbie, nice in Bockhammer again. Some of you have a big fan of Paramida, who I'm a big star. I'm a big fan of Mike Star, who I like, who I only find out through whore again. That platform has definitely introduced me to a lot of amazing DJs out there. So that should be cool. CTM is happening there again. LSD XOXO playing. You know, I'm just thinking about just now. Oddly. I was thinking, no wonder I've heard a lot of stories about people that live over there, right? Berlin, who say, oh, um, they're over going out. They just don't go out anymore. And they just, you know, live a, a quasi adult, mature, normal, sophisticated life where they don't spend their time, you know, crushing up kit on the flipping kitchen counter. It makes sense, though, doesn't it? Looking at this, because I just told you prior podcasts ago about, about the New Year's Eve to New Year's Day lineup, which is crazy. It's going all the way through, I think, the Friday way to Tuesday or something crazy like that. Then you've got whatever happens in November, whatever happens in October. It's like, it feels like to me, apart from the week that they take off after New Year's Eve or not, it's just a constant cycle of flipping events. So if anything, there's always something or always a distraction. And you feel like January is usually the time where people do New Year's resolutions. They do you know, uh, commitment to, to sobriety, commitment to not doing drugs, commitment to not going out, abstaining from sex, abstaining from gluttony, whatever it may be, you're doing something to sort of give you a bit of a refresh and allow you to kind of go into the new year with some sort of focus. But how can you, if every single time you turn around, there's some big event you're missing. So there's a CTM in January, there's this event happening in the beginning of January, then there's something happening in Feb because of Valentine's, all that sort of stuff. Then there's stuff happening in March, heading into summer. It just never ends. So it does make sense now thinking about it, why there's no real in between. There's either you go out or you don't. There's no like going out sometimes because eventually you'll get caught in the source um, or you get so lost in the source, not caught in it, <laughs> you get lost in the source. And sooner or rather later you realize it's the first of the month, you've only got five euros to your name. That should be a bit peak. But regardless, um, CTM lineup looks really cool. Happy Tears playing. Um, you've got Okta Okta back to back with Eris Stew, which is always a superb back-to-back -back duo i think it's probably one of the best back-to-back -back dj performances out there because i guess they're actually friends and they're actually collaborators and probably practice at home you know together and stuff but whenever i see clips of them playing together they look like they're having a time of their lives and clearly 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 their styles suit each other really well so that's definitely something to keep an eye on um then on the other one the 28th you have in background main room you have alan alan natter playing fatty moham marcel deepman monster who are a big fan of that girl was brilliant nastia raigal norman nodge so then in panama bar you got kiki lomo playing um you got K kim and foxman who i'm a big fan of he doesn't really get the props and the attention that she deserves but definitely great you got omar you got usam you got partok you got russell e l butler who sounds like an author you got yes in plane then the following weekend another ctm night you got audrey chen and hugo quintka doran sajah pierce porcy mary stephanie edgy and the body but the interesting thing I wonder as well, because a lot of these CTM artists are usually people who are kind of, you know, outside of the popular sort of attention span of people. I wonder if a lot of those people that get to play there for CTM eventually end up getting spots on the main Burger list, or it's just like a, one of those kind of weird cheat events where you say you can play, you say you play there, but did you really? You know what I mean? I, I wonder if it's one of those things. I'd imagine they're quite open to having Peter guys play because I'd imagine a lot of people that work there are really plugged in and maybe have. You know, maybe there's a feed that goes through the main Bergheim floor panel of our up to the offices. They have like an ability to listen to stuff in it as they're working. So they don't have to listen to it bleeding through the walls. Maybe I'm not too sure, but that'd be pretty cool. If you came to play at a festival that had nothing to do with the main club, they're just using it as a venue. And then you also got you the chances to get in front of the people that booked the place and they end up booking you for the main slot. That'd be pretty sick. But yeah, generally lineup looks amazing. 
cannot wait to go it's definitely something that's on my list now and it makes me far more happy and content that i'm not there for new year's eve because i was really really hoping i could go but you know say la vie say la bloody v next up i want to quickly give an update on this story that i spoke about tory which is funny slip of a tongue but this story i spoke about before regarding this new london club opening called the ton of bricks and I, for one, was just excited just from being a punter and from being an aspiring DJ myself that there's another place where potentially I could maybe play in the future and there's another place where I could potentially go and party my face off, sweat my face off, dance a bit, have some good times, meet some new people and enjoy the music and the vibes, right? That's the kind of only way I'm sort of looking at this sort of story. But obviously, when it comes to London, it's always multi-layered. There's always more to it than meets the eye. And this update, courtesy of RA, basically shines a light on something that I may have missed out on but also having read this and having done some research behind some things that have gone on with the club and the space over there i've got to a point where i'm just like enough enough so it's twofold but anyway let's read the story it says the opening of london club the, the ton of bricks met with controversy the new bricks and spots sits in what was formerly called club 414 an historic local venue that was forced to close in 2019 the launch of Tunnel Bricks, the South London Club for its UK promoters percolating Bricks and Jam, has been met with controversy. Set in officially open tomorrow, which is December 9th, we obviously it's passed already. The Bricks and Venue has been criticised for its ties to Taylor McWilliams, the controversial US property developer and part-time DJ whose investment firm Hondo Enterprises is considered an unwelcome, gentrifying force by much of the local community. Along with the Bricks and Village and Bright Market, bro, <laughs> he's flipping taking over the entire place, basically. Those are the only things that you'd go to Bricks and Ford, to be fair, especially if you're a normie. Um, the building housing the ton of bricks is one of several SY, SW9 assets in Honda's portfolio. The concerns also extend to the building's former tenant, the historic Club 414, which was evicted by the developer London Associated Properties LAP in May 2019 after 38 years. So they had the spot for 38 years and it got evicted in 2019. Three months later, LAP sold the premises to McWilliams for a reported 2.35 million. At the time, Hondo said it was committed to keeping the space as a music venue. The Tunnel Bridge project was also born in 2019. A contact of the Percolates co-founders connected them with the space. Percolate then approached Bricks and Jam in a bid to involve the local venue owner. The project, which has a 24-hour license, was repeatedly um, de delayed, partly due to COVID pandemic. DJ such as OK Williams, Sophie K, Jay Duncan, as well as Jumbi programmer Rudy Minto de Weiss. Have is they pronounced it? The, the Weiss or is it the Ige? And let's just say RMDW took to Instagram stories yesterday, December 7th, to criticize Tunnel Bricks. Um, RDDW said, Percolate and Bricks and Jam need to rethink their decision to open a club in the premises owned by McWilliams, describing it as a literal erasure of culture. A little bit dramatic there, but let you say what you want. London based platform Keep Hush, which was due to host a party at the club yesterday, decided to relocate to the near spot called Loki. Why didn't you go there in the first place? But hey, let's continue. Hannah T. Dubley, co founder of Local, a club like that ran the club at 414. Um, that ran a club night, sorry, for bomb form, had mixed feelings about the situation, um, which is probably the most mature side of things to look at it is like this. I'm really happy that a club will take over the new space. It means music. It means jobs. She told RA. But at the same time, I'm really devastating that the building is owned by Taylor McWilliams and feel guilt and regret that the activism that was put on to good use with Steve Noir wasn't able to keep 414 safe. Club founders Tony and Louise were really fucking special. Percolate and Bricks and Jam now has res now responded to the concerns with a joint statement sent to RA. Um, there's a statement. They say we are we are we are well aware of the importance of Club 414, and we don't give a fuck. <laughs> it continues to many in the area and the legacy and it leaves behind. This closing was a huge loss of Bricks and Night Life scene, and we joined you in mourning what, <laughs> what the owners built. <laughs> Uh, this is such full of shit but i love it <laughs> you have to do these things just to appease people but essentially we're not going to close we're not going to change anything we're going to do what we're going to do you have to get over it but let's continue to be clear we're in no way connected to the depiction we are committed to honoring the legacy as an independent grassroots music venue and maintaining this space for nurturing local talent we're committed to supporting bricks and nightlife and providing somewhere special to dance and enjoy the fantastic diverse scene that takes back decades in the area <laughs> whitewashed brixton has been cornerstone venue of the area two decades and percolate forged this early identity in the what's that how do you say that in a simulacra 
Simulacra, Simulacra, Simulacra Studios on Cold Harbor Lane almost a decade ago. We are deeply, um, we care deeply about the area and want to make sure that the Tunnel Bricks helps history develop the space to live on. All right, cool. We first met when we first were approached about the site in 2019. They meant just to stress that we were approached. So damage is already done. Leave me alone. We are told by the property agent that it was an unoccupied as a previous landlords to Hondo Market Lane. Um, had a victim club for one for tenants after a long process dating back to 2014 according to bricks and buzz this had previously included the turn the space into a luxury flats or a b at one market road uh, limited when we started tunnel bricks project it was well before the save i know campaign began in 2020 so saying look don't get us involved this could have been worse this could have been a flipping a tower block made out of glass and flipping you know steel with some horrible dilapidated sterile coffee shop downstairs where everybody greets you by saying what's up or something Jeremy, you know I it could be that bad when we started tunnel bricks project we were well before the save our note campaign happened and tay mcwilliams honda weren't in the spotlight as they are now we had no involvement with the hondo house outside of the fact that there are landlords that we pay rent to the same as a huge number of other independent businesses across Brixton and village or market room beyond i thought they're gonna start naming names Ooh. um we have been in touch with the key voices in Brixton community throughout the process opening the venue the input has been invaluable and we're very grateful for it <laughs> input mate um 20 that's one of the most useless kind of terms people can use for you all right input we want your input can we touch bases that's just like, you know, we're going to pay you to, you know, to share your expertise and your knowledge. No, actually, we're not going to pay you. We're going to meet you and we're going to extract all the knowledge and expertise that you know about. And then we're just going to send you on your merry way. But you're going to be happy because you got the chance to talk to us. That's a special. Anyway, it continues. At the same time, we spoke to prominent voices in, in the area, including Bricks and Buzz and members of the Save Our Noir campaign, as well as the local figures in the music scene. Um, these discussions were part of a wider effort to make sure that the venue got off to a right start and to build a reputation with high standards that we set ourselves. This proposal included supporting live music from the area, providing hospitality for the local bars, free entry after after their shifts, and stocking beers from local breweries, as well as hosting open decks for aspiring DJs and more. <laughs> this legitimately made me laugh when I said open decks because I was like, hold on, I've been to a few open decks. Does that mean an open decks night is essentially a weird kind of affirmative action thing? That's them sort of trying to address the imbalance in this industry and scene. There's not enough women. There's not enough black people playing. So let's have these open deck nights out because it's going to attract people that don't usually get to play. And they're going to be a lot of, you know, <laughs> a lot of women, a lot of black people. <laughs> they're going to come and want to play here and make their name and play in front of like 10 people on a Wednesday night. And then we basically ticked off the, you know, we ticked our, you know, our social justice obligations off that list on that day or for the week or for the month. I never looked at it that way. I never looked at open deck nights. I legitimately looked at it as like a showcase. You know, like how you go to like, um, like there's an open mic for, you know, in terms of music, you know, in terms of comedy, whatever it may be, poetry, there's like open mic events you can go to. And the idea behind that is that if you do a good enough job at an open mic, either your performance is good or you bring on a ton of people, they may then tell you, hey, we're going to give you some dates and they're going to pay you in advance and you get a cut of the tickets, whatever. But it's a way to kind of get your career kickstarted. That's why I found open deck tonight was, but essentially I was a, a kind of, um, I was a, an unwitting accomplice you know, to this place's attempt to rewrite the racial imbalances in the industry. Honestly, fucking incredible. But I can't blame them, though, to be fair to them. They did treat me right, Bricks and Jam. I went to the open deck tonight. Somebody, I guess, liked my set enough to recommend me to play at a following party that happened maybe a couple of months after that, which was a pretty big one. Even though I played like an opening set, it was still really busy. I got a chance to play in front of a crowd. I got to meet some other people playing too. It was fun. Do you know what I mean? So I don't have nothing bad to say about those guys specifically, but I just find it hilarious that this is one of the terms they put into the thing. Like, hey, we're going to host open deck night so you blackies can come along and play as well. <laughs> anyway back in 2019 when we started the venture before COVID-19 pandemic it was estimated that 40% of London venues had closed in the last decade which was massively escalated to the crisis levels of the previous two years we want to launch something that bucks this trend and provide the positive force in the area after lying vacant we're excited about opening and welcome everyone to the venue basically saying fuck you we're gonna open it anyway which I understand so my thinking about all this is that 
I've kind of had enough with the complaining. I understand gentrification is bad. Boo hoo hoo. It really does wreck and ruin places. I've seen it with my own bloody eyes from the places that I grew up in in London, especially places like Canning Town, Custom House, Stratford, Plasto, Upton Park, Forest Gate, Leighton, Leightonstone, Wolverhampton. So all these places have been flipping this, you know, flipping annihilated when it comes to gentrification and even hackney to some extent but i didn't really grow up there for the most part even though i hanged out there quite a bit so i get it i understand where the frustration is coming from but let's be honest as well i don't really see much effort or many kind of um ideas kind of being sprung from the dance music scene or the nightlife scene of people basically gathering their resources together and their collective minds to find out cool and interesting ideas that they can get around to circumnavigate things whether it means some of them maybe pitches in some money to buy the buildings in some sort of a you know cohort thing or whatever maybe where everyone puts in a bit of money each way or they you know work out a plan with the landlord to extend the lease for a long time or talk to a council there's not really any clever solutions in play everyone's kind of just going to the places that are already set up and already done doing stuff you know under the table kind of underground but i don't really see people making an effort for the most part to really go a long way to try and create the space that they want that they see doesn't really exist because essentially when you put on a club night you're essentially trying to fill a void that you don't see out there and the only way you can do it the kind of affordable way at when you first start is just to go somewhere else and kind of plug in your community plug in your sound plug in your vibe into what they're already doing but over time especially if you're somebody that kind of cares about what you're doing you realize that there are always going to be a sort of a ceiling that you are going to eventually hit especially in london when it comes to noise complaints when it comes to local councils when it comes to just uh you know the the temporary nature of the whole thing right because i always say these scenes only really last for four years really and then you kind of have to keep reinventing yourself to a certain extent so the only way to really do it in a sustainable way would be to own your own spot so you have different things going on at the same time so you're kind of always you know um always at the front of the trends when things are changing and not tr not desperately trying to chase them but that's the thing that's really concerning. I don't really see any difference because I've heard these complaints from years and years ago. And it seems that nothing has really changed when it comes to the council side of things. Nothing's really changed from these, you know, um, parasitical, you know, or, you know, predatory flipping, you know, um, gentrifiers coming in and taking advantage of places that are dilapidated that probably don't have people that maybe have the means to buy these places in the first place, but they've got a lot of hype and hipster energy behind them and they obviously go into it so they can obviously make a ton of money. But also the people who live there make these places cool. You guys need to make more of an effort to figure something out. I don't know what it is right now. Like I said, there could be a cohort or something. There could be some agreement with the landlord, but it has to be some solution to this and make it work because I feel like all these complaints are really a nonsense like if you look at this story in in actuality this these landlords who owned club 414 again i'm only looking at it from the outside in i'm not from brixton i know nothing about the local scene there Lo london is very territorial that way if you hang out in east you only stay in east if you hang out in north you only stay in north and visa you know and and blah 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 so i only know what i know about what i'm viewing based on the articles i read and some other bits and bobs that i've been you know privy to but from what i'm aware of this place you were there for what more than two decades in this club 414 the building eventually only in my opinion only ended up selling for 2.5 million surely in those two decades plus there could have been a solution to maybe do a fundraiser do something to have the ability to buy the building yourself so you can safeguard your future and the future of the club for years to come and then if you want to hand it over to like the new generation people to kind of do what they need to do to it then fair enough but this idea that over 20 plus years nobody had any kind of inkling or ability to buy the place i don't necessarily believe i'm sure there's going to be some things in place some laws or stipulations put into place maybe you know especially if you don't have a passport or something along those kind of lines or you don't have permanent residency stay in the uk that might affect your ability to buy places but i feel like there isn't enough ingenuity behind figuring out how to make these places work and how to basically maybe work in conjunction with the local community or just figure out a way to set up your own space there's loads of complaining and pointing at a boogeyman that is flipping you know um gentrifiers and property developers and stuff which is easy to do because it's clear what they're doing is abhorrent and taking advantage again of really horrible you know areas and the dilapidation in them and the lack of care that's gone into them and whatnot and maybe the you know the, the poverty that surrounds it 
But surely there must be a solution to this. Surely there must be because we can't just keep complaining about gentrification all day long whilst there's clearly a real need for these spaces and these clubs to exist because people still clamor to them. The opening night, or I think the big night, I think maybe it was Saturday or something, completely sold out. I know that might be deceptive because they may have put on you a certain amount of tickets on there, whatever you want to say. But still, clearly, there's an appetite for it or somebody like a Brixton Jam wouldn't bother even getting involved because they've already got a pretty good situation going for them where Brixton Jam, I'm sure Percolate probably don't need the extra hassle also. So they definitely saw that there was a gap in the market that they could take advantage of that could maybe service a particular crowd of people People who maybe haven't been servicing that part of South London and they're opening it so it's not like these spaces are going to waste people are going to fill them if that's the case why don't we from the community do it ourselves sort of always waiting until the last minute and then by that time it's too late and developers when they come in as abhorrent as it is it's their money they can do what the hell they want with it they want to turn turn it into the headquarters for flipping cost of coffee they can do so it's disgusting and it takes away from everything that we love especially myself being on you know being somebody that was out in Dawson for a while and then seeing how it's changed and you know you've got a fucking brew dog on that fucking street for bloody you know as a good example but i feel like over time there just needs to come a point where people just say enough is enough and just start making or setting up their own clubs or buying their own spaces or making sure they can secure the long-term future of the spaces they are using by maybe asking some questions from behind the scenes about what's going on how they can get involved that way because it's all well and good setting up flyers all well and good designing the flyers putting lineups together playing somewhere but if these spaces we don't own there's no way we can go forward especially considering that we have little to no help from the government for the most part right what, what the fuck is amy lammy where is she in this situation every time something like this happens you call her name and you're screaming and she's nowhere to be found she has one of the bestest and easiest jobs i've ever seen in my entire life when it comes to a government official she's meant to look after nightlife she's meant to be an advocate for clubs and you know people that love to go out you know in the night in general and she's nowhere to be seen at night in the day nowhere to be seen but collecting a government check nonetheless those are people that should be helping but they don't so if that's the case i like to always live in the world as it is as opposed to be trying to imagine a utopia where all things being equal no things are equal no things are fair we have to get into the mud with these property developers and put in bids and orders for them because if they were able to buy that venue i think it says here 2.5 million right if i'm not mistaken they purchased it for 2.5 million i don't know 2.35 million sorry i don't think these people who were at the place already 38 years so more than two decades right more than three decades nearly four decades they were there and they didn't have the ability to put together 2.35 million whether or not it was from their own funds whether or not it's from fundraising whether or not it's from a patreon um or something right or some or someone basically maybe just loved the place and wanted to help out donation whether maybe there could have been something done beforehand to before we got to this place um but you know we are where we are now at the moment i guess they're trying to meet the community in the middle by you know having these having these affirmative action open decks and stuff but you know i don't know man i just feel like there's too much complaining going on now i don't think you can blame bricks and jam i don't think you can blame percolate for trying to fill a gap fill a void and provide london with much needed club space because we don't have enough to be honest that's what i've always said i feel like every area in london needs to have at least one if not two folds where you've got a place where you can go and party until 6 a.m every single weekend needs to exist because i feel like that'll take a lot of stress away from the you know local services police ambulances whatever they may be and also put money back into the community where people are going out all day long they can get a breakfast in the morning at the local cafe they can maybe go to the office i mean you know post office on the way home so maybe get another drink for the afters whatever it may be do like i've seen the differences done to the area that i grew up in in canning town and it's kind of reinvigorated the whole place because now there's a you know a constant stream of people going there to hang out to go to the party to leave to go home again so all the local shops have basically seen a boom and an uptick in the amount of people going in there on a daily basis but you need at least one of those places in each part of london each part and the fact that there's one already exists now that they're doing and they're trying to set up and some more coming is a good thing obviously it's been done in some you know there's some skullduggery involved as per usual when it comes to the housing market but i feel like there should be no more time for complaining and whining about these sort of things we need to take some action at the very least to protect the things that we love and it seems that people are not doing it so far but hopefully this will be the change that we need to see going forward so less complaining more doing and hopefully we can be the change that we need to see and then i was also thinking about miami art basel that just happened because it felt like it just came and absolutely went i've not seen 
much footage around it i've not seen many people posting about it maybe because it's on social media and instagram and i haven't really been on there for a while but i don't know i just feel as if like the f- coverage on it in terms of a cultural sense has waned and i wonder if it's a consequence of the economy we're in at the moment and the fact that we're you know currently in a global recession to some extent or is it just the fact that people are kind of bored of what's on display at the moment, especially with the prevalence of AI art and flipping NFTs and all this sort of nonsense that maybe we finally reached a kind of glass ceiling when it comes to these big sort of corporate, you know, artist exhibition events, free trade show type of things. For me, when I was growing up, this is always one of the, you know, places to go to on the list of the what was it on a list of the influencer world tour type of vibe right to borrow a term from Heron Preston's t-shirt this was kind of that kind of thing where these are one of the things that you'd go to alongside with a Paris Fashion Week alongside with maybe Coachella uh, maybe some other trade show like Agenda when that used to be on RIP maybe Complex Con now but there'll be certain things on in the kind of influencer calendar that you had to go to to be seen and to make sure that you're touching faces, shaking hands and meeting the right people to allow you to have the ability to get boxes of shoes or invites sent to you, you know, on a consistent basis. And now for some reason, I'm not too sure what's happened, like I said, but I feel as if like Miami Art Basel, um, so Art Basel Miami has definitely lost a little bit of his panache. It's just kind of gone. I feel like the people who are there, who are well known, have essentially been paid to go there. I don't feel like a lot of those people are there, you know, through their own volition. They're definitely there because somebody paid them. I feel like the patrons are there to be seen, but then no one cares that they're there. And then the brands that are there are also there just because it's a kind of cultural obligation. Like how I used to do when I used to be a social media manager, you'd go and there'd be a list of these dates during the year or you know maybe it's international burger day pancake day whatever it may be and you'd have those dotted into your content calendar so that you would share them on days you don't have anything to share in terms of internal news in terms of products or service features or updates you'd use those little um you know dates already in the calendar those kind of you know novelty days like pancake day and burger day to kind of boost your message and to kind of you know have it piggyback off of the algorithm that's kind of going on at the moment or the virality of the trend but i feel like with this our puzzle it's like nobody even knows when it's on nobody cares that you're there so if you if you are going there to be seen by the people who are there to be seen no one actually cares so it's a really strange place to be in overall but i don't know i'm just wondering why what happened because i feel like a lot of the time a lot of people that went there legitimately went there because they just went to go they weren't they didn't even need to get paid whereas now legit the pictures i've seen of people who are somewhat famous look like they're bored out of their skulls they could be anywhere else in the world but there but here they are so i don't know i'm not really too sure what the deal is i'm just looking at some pictures here scanning on the screen checking out some of the quote-unquote art you know it's nothing that you would legitimately leave your house with to check for in any way shape or form i'm sure some of the more interesting high caliber people maybe just let leave the places alone and just kind of stay next stick to their galleries and whatnot maybe there's a whole different kind of you know feeling behind that also when it comes to that sort of stuff some of the bigger selling artists are the ones that maybe attract the most viewers will probably have made a stand against it for whatever reason i'm not really too sure about the ins and outs of the art industry in that sense but just from an outsider's point of view it definitely has lost a little bit of a spark and i don't really know why i say i say i don't but then i'm looking at the art and it does look a bit shitty but again it's all subjective so you can't really say that even though you can but yeah maybe there's something in the quality of the art that's maybe letting the event down or maybe people are just generally over it who bloody knows but i've not seen anything on my cultural um wire or you know ticker tape that's basically told me that something has happened it just felt like a natural slowly but sure malaise as you can see from this cassette tape um print out or sculpture or not sure that says are you out of your mind um with a picture of a sandy beach and some ocean or maybe it's a sky and some ground however you look at it but clearly something has been lost and something's gone missing with our basel miami beach 2022 but again not seen that much of it so far but the one thing i did see that did get a lot of attention was this great idea and i'm pretty sure this was from mischief where they had this atm machine where you could i guess input your card and it would get capture your balance and it would put you in the leaderboard and then people could see who has the most money and i think at the time diplo was number one and then some other dude who came through and he takes a picture of you that has your picture up on there as well um on the machine 
and this dude came through who looked like you know your typical kind of eastern european um fly boy or rich guy with a suit on and his trophy wife just standing there and he had i think like nine million in his checking account or something stupid i was like god damn imagine just having nine million sitting in your current account just like you know eating a hole in your in your flipping pocket sometimes when i have 50 pounds or 100 pounds sitting in my account that i haven't transferred over to savings or ever i i feel like i'm a you know i mean i feel like i'm big i'm a big i'm a big dog when i head to shots because i don't i don't even check my monzo i already know what's in there i know there's 87 65 in there so you just hop in there and you feel like an absolute big dog imagine having nine mil just sitting there burning a hole in your pocket but this is a video of diplo um entering in his dls and putting himself up on the leaderboard leslie balance inquiry your checkings. Checking your savings. Should be your checkings. Right. All right. Yeah. So it looks like he had three mil sitting on his checking. The guy before Diplo that put a picture up there had two mil. The guy before had one mil in his checking. Another guy had five hundred thousand crazy a lot of dudes though that's another thing too a lot, a lot of dudes you don't see a lot of women on this list i'm not sure what that says about the economy i'm not sure what that says about capitalism i'm not sure what that says about the matriarchy the patriarchy sorry matriarchy or the patriarchy I'm not sure what that says but regardless this is maybe the funnest thing and the most impactful thing that i've seen come from the back of art basel but for the most part everyone else has kind of not really paid that much attention to it in any kind of similar shape or form to be fair oh yeah and this bin bag thing also right who is this from let's see here um chairs are also a prevalent talking point here courtesy of hype says chairs are a prevalent talking point throughout bars and the surrounding events located on the second floor just past the entrance of miami convention center people began to stop and gaze at the floating chair that colombian artist maria jose arona played which we saw already like horizontally suspended nearly six feet in the air arona played incredibly poised as she terrified subtly moving her fingers and limbs for during the event oh so that was actually her bloody hell so it was actual woman that was suspended in the air on the chair that was lying flat which is actually absolute floss installation originally went on view at the ballroom martha in 2011 another one staying on chairs harry nuriv brought a slice of new york through a work dubbed the trash bag sofa at bells on miami just across the street i was interested in separating the visual qualities of an object from the object itself transforming it into something that transcends how it's perceived said a designer in a statement although the surface looked like a trash bag found in the street nerve actually constructed it with leather so it's a leather looking trash bag essentially you can picture it on your head if you're not watching this and it basically sits like a normal sofa which kind of reminds me of what demna was doing at Balenciaga with those trash bags so i'm not too sure if this game before the trash bag but he probably is inspired by Demna because of his look. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's got those square-toed um, Balenciaga boots on as well. So maybe that was a play and extension of what Demna does. But, you know, great artists copy and steal and whatever that term is. So that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, apart from that, I've not really seen much more that's really of interest. There's a picture here that's your screen that looks like a picture of Marilyn Manson or Marilyn Monroe. So Marilyn Manson, Marilyn Monroe sucking on somebody's big toe, which maybe explains why... No, it's not Marilyn Monroe. That's Madonna, actually. Isn't it from the book Sex? Yeah, I'm not talking about. But there's a picture of Madonna from ages ago sucking on somebody's big toe, which might explain why Miami Art Basel isn't what it once was. But regardless, interesting nonetheless. Interesting nonetheless. Then to move on to that, we want to quickly talk about this picture that's kind of gone, I would say, semi-viral that consists of Kim Kardashian and Michelle Lamy. I'm assuming in either Michelle Lamy's home or Kim's home because, you know, at the time when Kim and Kanye were together, Kanye was inspired by a lot of the same interior designers and architects and furniture designers that Rick Owens essentially loves, right? Think brutalism, think maximalism, think, um, you know, uh, think stoicism, think minimalism, all those kind of notes kind of Kim, Kanye was also a big fan of. So I'm not too sure this could either be Kim's house or it could be, we could be Michelle Halami's home, but regardless, what you see is a picture here of Kim and Michelle Lamy looking very soapy in the bathroom while Kim sits there afloat at the top, consist considerably wearing head to toe what looks like to me to be Rick. You've got massive Rick jewelry here. You probably got some Skims underwear there, maybe. Um, and a uh, Rick Owens dress that looks like it's been torn to pieces. That looks absolutely incredible. And it looks like to me, considering what's been happening with Balenciaga, this could be a subtle indication 
that her team have decided to drop and abandon whatever collaboration or whatever sort of relationships they once had with Balenciaga and move over to doing stuff with Rick Owens. It could be, not too sure. The picture itself, if I'm not mistaken, is for the launch of Sister Magazine, which I'm a big fan of, which are now going to be launching a beauty-based mag. Um, issue one is due to come out or has already come out. I think it's got Michelle Lamy on the cover. She's definitely the cover star because she's all over their Instagram. But that's essentially what they're trying to do going forward. So this could just be a one-away shoot. That doesn't mean anything. But considering how big Kim is and how powerful she is and the influence she has on the industry and whatnot, and you know just the brand that she is in general, you don't normally think these things would happen out of the blue. They're not spontaneous. There's always a bit of calculation involved. So I can't imagine this is just a shoot for shoot's sake. This feels like the soft introduction or entry into Kim coming into a quote unquote Rick era, which would be quite a funny to see play out because if anything, even though some of the lengths may be similar-ish, the proportions are nowhere near similar than what she was wearing at Balenciaga for the most part. The aesthetic is completely different. Um, the you know the codes are different. I'd say for the most part, the fan base is probably less forgiving than maybe Balenciaga is. They're not as cynical. Um, they're not as shit postery. So that will probably lose a bit of its edge. And maybe even with that though, I think sensuality wise and maybe sex appeal wise, because I feel like you know maybe it's gross to say, but I feel like the best way to dress Kim in general, in my opinion, or the, the way she looks the best is definitely when it's mostly sex led. That's kind of how she came into the game, unfortunately, but she does have a really good way of kind of oozing that through pictures, even though she kind of, you know, maybe comes across as maybe having a bit of a dull personality, I think. So dressing her in this way, maybe it suits her better than wearing, you know, really big and gargantuan Balenciaga, you know, outfits that maybe would suit somebody who's a bit taller, a little bit more skinny, or maybe looking a bit more European in their for sex appeal, where they basically claim their sex appeal from the roll up cigarettes that they, you know, smoke outside the galleries. But I think this actually does suit her. When I think of some of the women's looks and runway looks that come through down the runway, you know, there's a lot of layering, there's a lot of kind of pieces on top of pieces. If you strip back some of the stuff and, you know, do some tailoring here or there, it could probably suit her quite a lot. But the thing that I find really funny about this is that this is obviously a clear attempt to distance for themselves from Balenciaga, which is funny because, you know, fashion people, especially when you're in the moment, you legitimately feel like you're the center of the universe. Like you're the only person that matters and everyone around you makes you feel like you're the only person that matters also. But then if you go cold or if you hear a bit of controversy, suddenly no one really cares about you anymore and you're currently not the person that matters and things slowly change so in my head i feel like it would be far more impressive actually it'd show a far better mark of loyalty and will definitely go a long way to prove hey i'm my own person i can do what the hell i want i'm not affected by the whims and the emotions and the temporary outrage culture nature of people in public i'm gonna stick with balenciaga and i'm gonna stick with them though because i like what they do we've got this good collaboration they pay me well they treat me well and this is the brand essentially if you think about it even though she's got a partnership with dng and you don't hear much about it right kim and i think the whole family does anybody with dusty gabbana i'm pretty sure they paid for someone's who they paid the wedding for might be corny right i think they paid for the wedding or that one but there's a collaboration and a partnership with those guys involved but you don't really hear much about it. i'm not just sure if it's like a purposeful thing done on the kardashian side of things because you know dng have their own scandals they're going through you don't want to be associated with them too closely but you know You'd still say Balenciaga definitely were the people. Demna specifically was the one who definitely gave Kim the legitimacy in the scene in the industry going forward. You know, apart from obviously Kanye, who kind of held her hand and kind of gave her the intro, but the kind of next step, it was definitely more of a Demna thing. So it would be a far greater mark of loyalty and friendship to actually say, hey, no, I'm sticking with you. I know everyone's kind of saying you're essentially, you know, trafficking kids under the guise of fashion, or whatever it may be. I'm going to stick with you regardless, even though I have four children of my own. I'm going to put my morals and principles to one side. I'm not going to draw a line on the side and I'm going to stick with you because you're my friend, quote unquote. But that's not how the industry works. The industry is cold. The industry is um, without any emotion. It doesn't care about anything you're going through and it's not personal and it just moves on. So he's going through what he's going through. He's in his darkest probably period as a designer. You know, there's people making articles about lots of flipping Volkova, being a flipping 
being a Satanist or something, which is crazy considering how much of a fanboy I am of her work and her styling and the early Demina Vet Monday. So that's been crazy to see. But in his darkest moments, when he needs his friends and family, they all abandon him, apart from Kanye, right? Which is probably the only person you don't want supporting you in public now, considering all the things that he's saying and how radioactive he is. But it just shows you, man, like the scene and industry just moves on. Demina was legitimately the number one flipping person at one time and you heard no defense of anything concerning those um editorials that were put in or those campaign shoots that were put out with the kids with the bdsm toys you heard no real defense from anybody in the industry regarding with a document strewn on the table with that campaign featuring nicole kidman all those people that were jacking him off you know at the back of the flipping um you know at the end of the shows behind the scenes uh behind whatever maybe behind the curtain they're nowhere to be found now in his darkest moments where are they know it's be found it just shows that you should really enjoy the scene for what it is maybe cultivate a community of people around you that are legitimately your real friends but never mistaken all the press and the hype and attention you're getting from these media people as love or as affection or as a sign of loyalty friendship whatever it may be because it's just temporary you are com you are you are beneficial and you have some value to them in that moment maybe for those few years but once you have exhausted your use they'll move on to the next person quite quickly as you can see from this picture this is effectively moving on this is like you break up with somebody and then they post a picture of themselves in someone's house with their feet you know what i mean clearly showing you hey i've moved on now see you later and this is clearly a see you later type of moment but still as a rick fanboy i'm still eager to see what happens from it what we get from it um, I'm eager to see the evolution of Rick because I feel like now it's funny because I feel like most hood girls, especially in America, they love wearing those double um, sole bumper sole flipping Ricks that I have or just a regular Ramones or, you know, I don't see many. Yeah, actually Geobaskis as well in the pink. So clearly Rick has basically penetrated parts of, I would say, normal people, you know, style and sense of fashion, which is kind of cool to see. So it'll be interesting to see if Kim wears it if it then but you know kind of pierces through the consciousness of regular schmegular you know um vanilla flipping coffee women type people i wonder if they're going to be fans of it also because it's quite challenging to wear especially some of the women's stuff even the stuff nowadays it's not the most easiest it's kind of fashion with a capital f which is maybe why blin did so well in general if you think about it right it's mostly streetwear type regular people type clothing right button-ups hoodies jackets um leather jackets and stuff it's nothing really too outrageous in terms of fashion sense maybe a couple of the shirts and jumpers that had other stows sewed onto them or arms cut off cool but in terms of the silhouettes they were kind of you know stuff that you're familiar with but rick is all really different right he drapes all the stuff on the body there's lumps and bumps sticking out places there's you know mesh that looks like it's been ripped open as you can see there from that picture there's chunky jewelry that looks like something that came off of a, a bolt on a monster truck there's all these interesting things that appear and i find it all kind of interesting to look at but again as a rick fanboy i'm gonna eagerly anticipate what happens when they do eventually launch it and i'm sure it's going to be absolutely fantastic anyway going forward and i cannot cannot wait then i went to talk about and highlight this story courtesy of complex regarding these um sneaker designers or customizers called cool kai and obviously omi and the hellcat who most of you guys know from going down and having that kind of trouble with the police and fbi due to his um scam or this service he was running where he was allowing people to basically stream tv channels or shows off of this little usb card thing that he had i forgot the whole story behind it but you know i mean heck out of this guy but it looks like nike are finally coming down on these dudes who were selling these shoes and making a real hefty hefty amount of money i think during the start of the pandemic i felt like i saw these shoes come out of nowhere i feel like before it maybe did exist but they definitely kind of popped and went kind of in you know went nuclear during the pandemic maybe because people legitimately were hustling to make sure they can keep a roof over their head but regardless these sort of shoes were essentially where you take a jordan silhouette and you just replace the swoosh with your own logo in the case of the cool kai his one was like a funder um omni obviously did a funder too because they had the beef and they fell out and to prove a point he just did the same shoe as him then you've also got i was thinking who's the other person who had something um then you've got obviously warren lotus he had his own thing you got the flipping rapper i forgot his name um nah he's got one as well then obviously you've got um that guy a dude who's different but you know basically in air force one with his little g symbol but that was a thing that everyone was doing for a very very long time as you can see here from the lawsuit 
you've got a genuine Air Force One here from Air, Nike um, Air Jordan. Then you've got the cool Kai ones, and then you've got an Omi no no ones. And I like how they say knockoffs, uh, Kai knockoffs, Omi knockoffs. So there's all there listed. And this is an article courtesy of Complex. It says Nike has filed a manufacturing agreement. So agreement and man, I guess factured and trademark infringement lawsuit against two popular sneaker designers and the manufacturer of their footwear. The swoosh filed yesterday in the Southern District of South New York and lawsuit that spans six different complaints. Nike says defendants Nick One are uh, of uh, what name? Nick One Arvinger and David Weeks of Bai Kai, um, aka Cool Kai and Bill Omar Christ Quiller of Reloaded Merch on um, the Hellcat have been promoting, copying, and selling Nike designs, namely the Air Jordan and Dunk as their own. Look, that is really egregious. I'm looking at it, right? There's a picture here of these Dunk Lows, SBs, and they're essentially the same colorway, just with the flipping swoosh changed. That is so egregious. It continues. Nike's lawyer said they notified Kyle of the alleged infringement on August 6, 2021, and attempted to reach a resolution with the company to no avail. They also contacted Omni in October of the 5th, 2020. Oh, 2021, I'm assuming too, not 2002. Jesus, with a similar warning. The document sent to Omni, which was viewed by Complex, stated that the brand had one week to contact Nike's lawyers to discuss the matter or that it would be a federal lawsuit. Despite these advanced warnings, yesterday's lawsuit alleges that Kai and Omni continue to profit off the infringement designs. Oh, they're going to have to settle out of court or they're going to have to pay a big fine regardless. But it's just so stupid. I do not understand this. You got that kind of warning. And then you still go ahead and do it anyway. Crazy. Um, in the lawsuit, Nike also takes aim at the China-based manufacturer, Xiaim Wandering Planet Import and Export. Wandering Planet for short. Yo, this is crazy. They've actually exposed the manufacturers as well. You got to assume a lot of these guys keep secret, right? They try to make it seem like it's some underground, undercover thing when I'm assuming you can probably find all these manufacturers on Alibaba if you check close enough or even AliExpress. But now you actually know what the names of these people are because they're going to be happy to do business with you anyway, regardless. In the filing stating that the Wandering Planet played a pivotal role in the infringement by providing resources to produce shoes for Kai and Omi. By supplying Kai and Omi with knockoff sneakers using Nike's registered Night Edge Jordan 1 and Dunky trade dress, Wandering Planet and it knowingly participated in a scheme to intentionally create confusion in the marketplace and capitalize on it. Several side-by-side -side comparisons between Nike products and Kai and Omi designs are littered throughout the documents. So this is Nike's wording. They actually wrote this in the documents. They actually wrote Omi knockoff. <laughs> That's so offensive. Gee, they took it personally, legitimately. You'd imagine these are just faceless corporate types, but they're legitimately taking this really, really personally, which explains a lot. If you ever worked, you know, with people from Nike or been there to the offices or had interviews, you know how seriously they take the brand for real. Like you turn up to a Nike interview wearing Vans and you're going to have an issue. Not even Adidas, it's just like Vans. Like, and you don't have any money in your debt because you need a job to get the money to buy the shoes or whatever it may be. Or because you just worn Vans that day because, you know, they're the comfortable shoes that you wanted to wear for an interview. You would definitely feel it for sure. And you'd feel it from a receptionist. Someone's not even interviewing. You'd be like, oh my God, how come you're in Vans or some cleaner? You're like, why do these people care? And then you get the interview, you realize, oh, they were trying to warn me. <laughs> this is a big deal. So it continues. Several side-by-side -side comparisons between Nike products and Kai and Omi designs are littered throughout the documents uh, as an example for the social media posts from confused consumers. Cool Kai took the whole Jordan 1 design, one reads comment, and everyone says, these are Jordans? <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine, right? I didn't actually think about that, about the amount of easily duped kids out there who are just kind of browsing social media. They get all their news from there. They don't actually read Hypebeast or go on nice kicks or sneaky freak or whatnot they're just getting all the information directly fed through instagram then you see these abominations on the side which are jordan one low knockoffs with the thunderbolt on the side that kind of looks a little bit revenge stormish and they've got a very shiny plastic look to them which is funny because nowadays what's made it hilarious all these knockoffs especially when you think about replica shoes is that the quality of the actual shoes you get from nike and air jordan or jordan brand have gone down considerably to the point now where knockoffs are easier to copy because the the original source material is so crap. In some cases, I've seen some instances when I'm reading rep sneakers where some people are saying that the legit pair actually is less is not as good quality as the rep pair because there's so many clear mistakes or quality control errors that the factories can't even repeat. So they're trying to make the best product 
Whereas Nike is cutting corners and just pushing out wherever they can push out and not scrapping it, I guess, because they don't want to waste any more money or whatnot. But I would just find it hilarious how some kid who just wants to look like Ace at Rocky or Tyler Travis or Travis Scott, for instance, is just browsing social media, finds, finds these and thinks they're legit or thinks there's some sort of collaboration or something from, with Fragment, buys them and then realizes they're fucking knockoffs. It's absolutely hilarious. From two guys I'd never heard of, Cool Kai and fucking Omi and the Hellcat, you know? Imagine having a brand called Cool Kai and you're wearing those on your feet. Next level. Along with trademark infringement, Nike says that Kai and Omi's designs are also grounds for counts of false des- designation of origin and unfair competition and trademark dilution. The Swish's lawyers argue that the alleged knockoff sneakers are likely to confuse consumers about the origin of the products and Nike's connection to them, especially the secondary market where the highlights example the resellers use a variation of Adrian on one name to advertise cool products. Okay, cool. So people on eBay and stuff are buying limited edition cool Kai shoes, which is fucking insane. And then they're reselling them because, you know, the sneaker industry is fucking insane. But they're using the buzzwords or the tags in their listing. They're using Adrian on one so that if you are looking for an Air Jordan 1 backboard, you might stumble on the same colorway made by Cool Kai. Makes sense. Kai and Omi had a public disagreement of their own last year. According to Omi, the two competing designers had a falling out over their trade manufacturer. Sorry, I told him, listen, if you don't call back the manufacturer, I'm going to release your shoe for cheaper. Omi said, imagine that being your friend that they do that. Whenever your friends do something like this as the first retort at a slight, usually you should realize that that person never been your friend if that's the first if your friend the first thing they say is like fuck your dead sister or something they're probably not your friend that's the first thing they say during a disagreement that means they were holding that in for that long imagine you fall out with somebody as a business partner of yours and a friend and the first thing they do is okay cool to get you back i'm going to sell your shoe cheaper or the shoe that we both designed cheaper god almighty so what i did was took the shoe i took the brand and i ran with it it worked out for both of us honestly because we're both kind of popping off of me that's that's a that's as la and as flipping new gen of relationship i've ever seen in my entire life i fucked him over but it's good because he got money it's like what does money anyway let's continue um among his requests nike is asking that the court block any further production of the advertisement of the infringing sneakers it also asks the defendants provide any and all product packaging and promotion materials to be sent to nike for destruction <laughs> they want it to be sent to them so they can lie on fire not even go get it lit on fire somewhere else no give it to us and we'll set that sh- that trash on fire it's also exceeding compensation for the damages and related expenses although an exact monetary value has not been determined whoa um carasquilo Posted a message on Instagram in response to news saying that he was under the impression that Omi brand was in the clear and even as his lawyer is scratching his head. <laughs> oh, these guys are so egregious. How can you be scratching your head to this? How can you see this and scratch your head? Really? Come on. Stash, you're scratching your head when you see that. For real. Oh my god, man. Sneaker customizers are the most flagrant. Eh? They've got an ego that's really outsized considering that all they do is paint on shoes or add materials to shoes that already exist or in this case they make exact copies of shoes that already exist with just different logos on it it's nuts in conversation with complex carasquillo says he believes that the edge of the one inspired model is different enough to, for the real thing but the dunk inspired shoe will be an issue admitting not enough changes were made to the original everyone's doing it so i just thought <laughs> it ain't nothing of course you thought that which is stupid on my part carasquillo says the decision not to significantly alter the dunk inspired release key kai designer um co-founder also publicly posted a lawsuit saying the brand later posted the video parodying jordan brand's band air for 1950 response to the lawsuit nike did not respond to request for comment so my opinion on this thing i've always for the longest time hated sneaker customizers because i felt like they were always incredibly lazy i feel like most customizers especially the ones that came off at the back of the hype around like the just don has because i feel like the just don era was the time when sneaker customization got a bit crazy and people were going out all over the place i think that's maybe around the time that john geiger started doing his stuff also because i remember he had that shoe i was at like a whole lot of checks where it was at air force one high which might have been his best ever design even better than anything he does out of his own brand maybe except for the slippers where he did this jordan no i think so it's air force one high again where the model doesn't really get enough praise and then he put all these different swooshes in different materials on them so i think it had like five or four on the outside it looked absolutely brilliant one of my favorite air forces i've seen in a long 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 time but i feel like a lot of them were lazy for a lot of them just like you know just basically cut swooshes off and made it out of different materials painted them um you know 
painted the apples in some different colors maybe whatever it may be but it wasn't really that interesting wasn't that innovative wasn't that creative was a bit boring then when these people come across who are basically taking established shoes like a dunk or like a jordan that are already you know in trend and popular wherever it may be and then putting their own logo on them i thought this was the height of laziness because if anything this went against everything that i've kind of been aware of when it came to making reps or copies of already popping brands and sneakers it was always an option to be sort of things because for the most part the resources to make your own shoe from the ground up didn't really exist you didn't have the ability to do so and it was quite hard to do so anyway where would you even start so the good way to kind of get your foot in the industry and to kind of maybe make a bit of noise was maybe to copy something that already existed hoping that maybe you could use the last or the expertise of certain factories maybe you've done some other fakes and stuff to basically pick up the back of it and to kind of get your name out there in the hopes that once it pops off and you get your cease and desist you can then use whatever money you've made to then make your own thing from the ground up that was kind of it's kind of always like a temporary solution um for you to present your idea in footwear without having to fork out loads of money that was what i always assumed it was but it was also a good way to showcase your creativity like a babeser i think of a babeser and i think of the common adage or the common thinking behind it is that oh they had i remember back in the day in a forum somebody actually posted it where they had like the filing of all the design element changes that um Bapes are put together i think it was over a hundred little tweaks here and there all over the shoe so that effectively nike couldn't sue them for copying the air force one but i think the story actually which is closer to the truth is that whatever trademark or whatever flipping um pattern existed over the air force one shape had kind of run out by the time the babes that came out so they were effectively able to put the shoe out with no and little hassle but somewhere along the line there's some truth in both of those sort of statements but still you think of the babes and what do you think of immediately you think of bright crazy colorways so essentially looking at it from just a creative or design proposal type of idea nigo wanted an ability to present his ideas on an air force one type shoe he was not going to get a Nike collab anytime soon, especially back then. Collab was just harder to get than they are maybe nowadays, or maybe his relationship with Nike wasn't where it was, or maybe 22 or anything. Regardless, he liked, loved that silhouette, and he always imagined, hey, what if we had it in like a purple and blue, in this and that, in, pattern, in patent leather, in this leather, all these type of things were flowing in his head, and he put out colorways that you probably have never seen in a regular Air Force One for the most part most of the base the colorways are incredibly original incredibly fresh and very distinctive so even if you do see the shape and you recognize it as being a quote-unquote air force one shape the colorway will still let you know that it's something completely different whereas what these guys are doing from the core kai to the omi they're just taking already established colorways from jordan brands such as the black toes chicago's um the black and grays that they're taking all these colorways that already exist and that have a lot of history and a lot of flipping love behind them with people and sneakers and whatnot and just kind of making them with their own logo on it that's all they're doing essentially that's it and i feel like for me that's the height of you know lacking in creativity and any kind of you know design chops and whatnot and if anything it kind of doesn't really say anything to your level of taste and your ability to make cool things because you've just taken an already existing shoe and added your logo onto it what we want to see is do you have an ability to create something from the ground that represents what you're about and that can appeal to a certain demographic obviously you cannot so this is what they do so i don't really have any sympathy or empathy for any of these people in this situation especially if you've got that warning in the beginning i feel like even if you do just want to make these copies use it as a springboard to kind of get your name out there and pop off and put some money in your pocket but surely there has to have been an end goal in mind you should have had an idea of how this ends and sort of kind of work towards it knowing full well if nike decide to come around and put a lawsuit on your ass you're basically done but for the most part these guys thought this is gonna last forever they thought they were just gonna sit back wait for nike to put out a new color of a shoe see everybody missed out on it and then put it out in their own logo and help people buy it that's absolutely incredibly um silly and stupid for me in my eyes and i feel like an incredible waste of time all things considered but obviously goes to show that all sneaker customizers are complete trash they are they're just a waste of time they don't really know what they're doing and eventually um shit ends up catching up with them so i'm eager to see how this kind of works out in the end i feel like the copies are absolutely trash and didn't do anything i didn't feel interested to the flipping argument i feel like if you're a kid out there and you spend 200 dollars buying these fucking thunderbolt j1s you deserve every scam that comes your way unfortunately i don't make the rules it just is what it is and hopefully going forward things change with these people but you know most likely it will not most likely it will not anyway that is the excellent show episode number six two nine thanks again for checking me out 
if you have enjoyed this you know what to do make sure you share it with all your lovely friends and family that would be greatly appreciated and i shall be back again with another episode for you so very very soon but until then click the link in the bio to see your links regarding myself excellentzinga.com the link is in the description and you know down below if you're watching this video and the description if you listen to the audio and i'll also be doing a dj live stream i think on thursday so if you're around on thursday and you want to see me play then definitely keep an eye on the channel on the youtube channel specifically and you'll see that coming up very very soon and for podcast listeners i will add a link in the description to show you where you can go eventually to check out the stuff that i eventually will be playing but thanks again for checking me out i'll see you guys again very soon take care peace out